superficial Jesus, not that Jesus that, that they, they call the hypocrite, right? Not that Jesus, that fake Jesus. Y'all may have a seat, please. Uh, Kelly's going to come through and do tithes and offerings here. Um, and so, but, you know, man, we need to know the real Jesus, who he really is. That's what it's all about, that love, that Jesus, right? That Jesus that died on the cross for us, that Jesus. Uh, we want to know that Jesus, the one that really is, not the one that the world tells us that he is, right? Amen? Amen. Absolutely. And so um, I just want to welcome everyone home. God, God morning. Welcome home to celebrate. Welcome home as we continue in this series, this series on the heart of a leader through the life of Moses. Um, today we're going to learn what it's like to be unforgettable. Okay, um, we're going to see the, through the lens of Moses how to be unforgettable uh, in, in God's world, in God's, in God's currency, in his time, right? And so if you want to go to Deut Deuteronomy 31, you sure can. We'll catch up to you there soon. Um, but we're going we're to start with prayer. If you would, just please join me as we go before the Lord. Dear Lord, I thank you so, so very much. Father God, I... Uh, Man, I just ask for your hand to be all over. I mean, I just feel your presence is so, so overflowing in here right now, dear Lord. And I thank you so much that you would be willing to, you, you want to, you desire to have a relationship with us. You desire to be with us. You desire, you come to us and you say, hey, here I am. And, and, and Father God, I just thank you for each and every person who's here today who said, you know what, I want to be in the presence of the Lord today. I want to be filled with the Spirit today. I want to be filled with God's Word today. I want to receive what you have for me here today. Lord, I'm not going to stay in bed. I'm not going to just hang out. Lord, I'm coming to the house. And Father God, we just thank you for each and every person who's come here today. I thank you for the the Holy Spirit, that you're going to pour over them. I ask you, Lord, lead me, lead this message, dear Lord, that this message is your message, not my message, because it cannot be my message. My message would be human and it would be foul. And Father God, I just ask for your message, your anointing, your word, your, your heart, dear Lord, to be delivered today. Father God, I also ask that each and every person here receive it as you desire for them to, dear Lord. Each and every person is going to receive it just a little bit differently, and that's okay, Lord, and we thank you for that because each and every one of us is a little different, Lord. And so, Lord, we just, uh, we just we embrace it and we soak it in. Father God, if there's a heart that's closed off here, I ask you just to crush it open just to smash it that it might be able to receive, dear Lord, because the pot that's not broken cannot shine your light. It cannot receive it if it's a sealed vessel. And so, Father God, I ask you to unseal each and every heart here today. Father God, I just ask for your hand to be on each and every person, whether they're in-house or online. Don't make a difference, Father God, if they're receiving this message, that they would receive the entirety of this message to the entire level, the entire plan that you have for this message. Father God, I ask that there, there's some who aren't here because uh, they're not feeling well. There's some who aren't here uh, for one reason or another that's beyond their control. And Father God, I ask your hand on each and every one of them. There are some that, that we know and you know, dear Lord, that within our hearts right now, I would ask that each person just pray for that person they're, they're, they want prayer for. And Father God, we come together in unity for each of those persons, dear Lord, that you'd, you'd have your hand on each person, each each family, dear Lord, that you'd have your hand on each care team that's caring for those families, those individuals, dear Lord. And Father God, just ask for your hand on them. We ask for a healing hand. We ask for a blessing hand. We ask, Lord, we ask for way too much. And yet, Father God, because we don't deserve it, Father God. And yet you tell us to come because the only reason we don't receive is because we don't ask. So, Father God, right now, we ask for your hand on that on the struggles that are going on in hearts right now. There's some here who are not here today because they're struggling in their heart, Father God. They might be watching online, but they're struggling in their heart, dear Lord. And so, Father God, I just ask that you help our hearts to be meant to walk through that, dear Lord. Guide us through that. Let us see your light that we would follow your light, dear Lord. And today, as, as we look at Moses' life, as we continue, we wrap up this series, Father God, I just ask you help us to be as unforgettable as Moses is. Father God, just ask for your hand all over this. And Father God, we also come to you with the prayer that you, your son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Praise God, he lets us come together. Praise God, he lets us come together today. We're here together today. Come together as a family today. I want to share with you that I, I might have, you might have noticed, um, if you know anything about Moses, you might have noticed that we might have skipped a thing or two. Okay, we've kind of we've had to use a very broad brush stroke, yet very fine brush stroke also, because we're looking at Moses' life as as a leader and how we can use his examples for us to be the leaders that God calls us to be in the world that we're in. Right? And so, but if I if I were to try to preach to you, if I were to teach you all about Moses, oh my. Right? We'd have Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Man, we'd be through it all, right? And we could go and go and go and go, and we could preach for a year just on the life of Moses, and then we'd go into the second half of his life, right? And maybe even the third half of his life. And yes, if you do math, you got that, right? And so, right? I mean, I'm just like, man, there is so much. So I just, again, I want to encourage you, as I've been encouraging you, go study what we're not studying, what well, we're not reading, what I'm not talking about, right? Because this should not be the only Bible you have, okay? Uh, I should not be the only scripture you have in your life. And Moses has so much to offer us. Go there and study Moses. There's a reason he's still relevant to us 4,500 years after he lived, okay? Because Moses was unforgettable. And we're going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about that. This is the seventh message on this, okay? The f- first we said we, ho- we have to what? We have to be real, right? We have to be real. No matter, we have to be authentic, genuine. No matter what we got going on, on in our history, we still need to be real. In fact, even more so because of the junk in our past, right? And then we said we had to, we had to be um, driven, right? We talked about being driven, okay? Um, the whole, God has given us a passion. He's given us a task before us. He's given us things to do, and we need to be driven in those things to do them as God wants us to do them, right? As God has planned for us, not as we have, right? We talked about being uh, surrendered. We talked about being surrendered, right? And, and we need to surrender. We need to be committed and surrender, so we need to be committed to what God's called us to and surrender our lives to Him, surrender our hopes, our desires, our earthly yuck, because that's all it is compared to God's plan. We need to, we need to be able to submit it, uh, surrender it, I mean, to God's plan that we might be committed in Him, right? We talked about that. We need to be willing to do everything the way that God asks us to do it, and we need to be, we talked last week what? Smart, we need to be smart about it. Whether it's our, whether it's a ministry, or whether it's our family, or whether it's our our work, or whether whatever it is, we need to be smart about it. Live our life according to God's plan. Be committed to it. Be willing to be trapped within it. Be brave within the trap within it. Right? We need to be surrendered to it. Right? And so, so this week we're going to talk about how how do we do all these things, bring all these things together, be real, be authentic, be driven by the Spirit, not by the world, not by our own heart, but be driven by God's God's guide for us in our Holy Spirit. Right? How are we to do that? How do we become unforgettable? For one thing, if we do the first six, guess what? <laughs> we'll become unforgettable. And not for us, and not according to the world, but according to God and His plan for us. Okay? So let's, let's jump in today. And, and I, think, uh, I think, I don't know, maybe you don't, maybe you don't agree with me. Do you think Moses is unforgettable? I think he's unforgettable. 4,500 years later, we're still talking about Moses. People draw from him all the time, from his life, from what he did for God, for what he did when he ran away. 
Right? All of it. We can learn from all of it, right? From, the, from his birth when he was condemned to death, from the very birth of his self. From his, for, and honestly, that's from conception. Let's be honest, because at the moment of conception, when life actually begins, right? Not according to what the world says, but according to what God says, when life begins at conception, God knew he was coming out as a boy, a Hebrew boy. God knew he was going to be condemned. The moment he left his mother's womb, he was condemned to die. God knew that. And he took him from that to 4,500 years later, one of the greatest leaders we've ever had in our, in our history. Christian or no. Even those who don't believe in God still reference Moses. It's just amazing to me. I, I think he's relevant. I think, I think he's unforgettable. I think about this. He taught us how to worship. He, he, he brought on the festivals and all these things, right? The, the, all the stuff to, to, to remember how do we remember God, right? He, he taught us all these different things, and, and, and yet it's still today in Christianity, these things, we celebrate them. What do we celebrate them for? Well, according to the world, we celebrate them just so we have a day off of work, right? We, right? we get a little break, right? But as a true Christ follower, we celebrate them. Why? To glorify our God, right? That still goes today, 4,500 years later. The form of government he set up as he led this nomadic nation of one and a half million plus or minus a few. As he led them out of Egypt, as he led them through in, in, uh, to, to the Red Sea, through the Red Sea, right? As he led them into, on their little wander, their little walkabout of, of 40 years, right? I mean, he's, he's, he leads them. And, and in that, the form of government that he set up there, is actually the foundation of the government that we have here in the United States today. 4,500 years later, now I'm not saying about how we've soiled it since then. I'm talking about what he set up, what we actually based our, our, our founding fathers, a lot of what they based our country's government on is off of what Moses taught 4,500 years ago. He, he, he taught small government, <laughs> Do we like small government, <laughs> right? Or do we want our government in every bit of our business? Uh, thus, the Mosaic Law, we, we, we constantly reference Mosaic Law. Many of our laws are built off of the Ten Commandments, built off of the Mosaic Law, off of that 40-year walk through the, de through the wilderness, Right? I say 4,500 years later, if that stuff is still relevant today, I think that's pretty impressive and pretty unforgettable. If you, uh, uh, Moses leads the people to the Jordan River, okay? He leads them to the cusp of the promised land. And if we go and we read Numbers 20, um, study that, you'll find why, jo why Moses is not allowed to cross the Jordan into the promised land. And briefly, okay, I'm going to give you a brief on this, okay? Briefly, the Israelites wanting water, whining and complaining once again, be it's not in those little brats, okay? Uh, God doesn't provide enough. And, and they, were, they were complaining about water. And so Moses goes to the Lord. He says, take Aaron's staff, hold it over the rock, and ask for water, and I'll give it to you. And Moses threw a tiff, okay, and he got all snotty. And he said, since you want water, we'll give you, we'll give you water. And he strikes the rock with the staff. And God said, because you did not honor me, you did not give me the glory of it, you will never enter the promised land. Because what he did when he said, we... That's Moses and Aaron. He tried taking credit from God. Okay? Go back, study it. You'll find it. So Moses dies, um, and Joshua leads the children of Israel into the promised land, okay? 
Um, so we're going to look at that, though. Um, from, and from that point on, right, from that point on, for 400 years, for 400 years, they never had a, they didn't have a king. Uh, up until Saul, they didn't have a king. They didn't have, they didn't have uh, uh, um, a um, prime minister. They didn't have a president. They didn't have any of that, right? They, they, there was no formal leader. What there was was priests and prophets, the prophet would tell the people, this is what God is saying to us. He gave me this message for you. The prophet, that's what the prophets did. The priest then said, how do, we, how do we celebrate God? How do we worship God? And they were the ones who led that, okay? That's what led those, those two roles or whatever you want to call them, right? That's what led. They didn't, can you imagine the United States going without a president? Let me restate that. Okay. Could you could you imagine the United States going without a president, Great Britain going without a prime minister or the Queen of England, Japan, China without their emperors, right? Right? Could, could you imagine any country without its head of state and just listening to the people? God gives the message to. My land, we'd be in such great shape. Well, we listen to those people, right? Could you imagine that? I just, I just sit back and go, wow. And one and a half million, plus or minus, right? We're like, okay, prophet said, okay, this is what the priest said. The anointed priest, not the self-appointed priest, Right? Man, for 400 years, all set up because of what Moses did in his 40 years. Technically, his 120 years. But his 40 years of leading the Israelites. That's a great leader. That's someone we can learn from. That's someone who's not forgettable. I want you to understand something. If you will do what God asks of you to do, and you know, I, I really, it breaks my heart, the number of people who tell me, I know I should do this, but I'm just not comfortable doing it. The number of people who tell me, well, I, I knew I was supposed to, but I didn't. And they rejected what God was calling them to, because even if they don't understand it, because right? sometimes we don't understand, we don't know who God is. There's people out there, they don't know, there's some who deny that there is a God, right? Even they'll say, I knew I should have. It would have been, I, sh I know I should have done this. But it really breaks my heart for those who claim to be Christians, claim to be Christ followers, and God says, I want you to. And they go, well, but I'm just uncomfortable with that. I just don't think I can do that. And I get it because I lived it for a period of my life. Well, unfortunately, a large period of my life. But could you imagine what this world would be like if we were willing to be the leaders God has called us to be? So here's what I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you to live a life led by God by mosaic example along with the rest, okay, the rest of this entirety, right? To live his plan for your life instead of your plan for your life. To live his plan for your life the way he asks you to live it. Because sometimes, well, I'm doing what God called me to do, but I'm going to do it my way. Man, and we just blew it. But so if we'll live the plan he has for our life and we know it, right? Right? Um, even if, even if, hey, look, you might have to go get some wise counsel, right? Sometimes we have to say, this is where I, I just believe, I just want confirmation or affirmation, depending on what that looks like, right? And it might be a matter of not even saying the words to anyone, but you need to be affirmed because you're not certain, is that God saying it or is it me saying it? Most of the time, if you don't know if it's he or you, most of the time I would argue it's probably you or at best a combination thereof. 
because God speaks and he speaks clearly when we listen. Okay, so, so if we'll live the plan, he calls for us to live according to, according to his plan and with the people he puts around you because we're not supposed to do it alone. God will lead you to a life that is unforgettable for 4,500 years as well. It's all we got to do. It's all we got to do. I want us to start using some, some end game thinking. I never said end of the world, okay? <laughs> I said some end game thinking. We should always live as though it's the end of the world. Always as though today is the last day. Always as though this is my last breath. But I want us to do some end game thinking. And we're going to walk through that today as to what that means. What the, but in brief, in short, that means what when you're no longer here to do what you currently do, who's going to do it for you? Who's going to carry it on? Some will try saying it's a legacy. Some will say it's an inheritance that we pass along. But what I'm talking about is the, what God's called you to do. Who will pick up that mantle when you can no longer pick it up, when you're no longer here, as Moses had to do? Okay? Okay. And so you'll understand that a little better as we walk through this, okay? Some of you are thinking, why do I have to worry about it? It's not my problem. Because God never calls us into a leadership role that he doesn't expect us to make another leader to carry on. His plans aren't for today. His plans aren't just for my life. His plans are for the kingdom. And the kingdom goes on forever. Okay, so we have to get our mind out of, I'm just worried about what I want and what I'm doing. So we need to be looking at that. Who's going to carry on the mantle? When I have to, that day I take my last breath and that mantle is laid down, that day I no longer can do what I do right now, who's going to pick that up and carry it? Because someone needs to. God didn't call me into ministry for ministry just to die here when I die. He didn't call you into whatever ministry you're in for that ministry to die the day you take your last breath or the day you can no longer carry it out. So we're going to look at that today. We've been in Exodus all this time. So when I said Deuteronomy, I meant Deuteronomy a little bit ago, okay? So, but we're going to, because we need to, that's, that's where we wind up with Moses as, as a leader, okay? Deuteronomy 31, verse 1 says, Then Moses went out and spoke these words to all Israel. I am now 120 years old, and I am no longer able to lead you. The Lord has said to me, You shall not cross the Jordan. The Lord your God uh, himself will cross over ahead of you. He will destroy these nations before you, and he will take possession of their land. Folks, listen to this, uh, by the way, um, and this is just a total sidebar. He's already defeated absolutely everything that will ever, ever rise up before you. And when we get that going here, we get wise in that. When we understand it here, and even more importantly here, when we understand that, there is nothing we can overcome according to God's plan. Difference being, is it mine or is it his? There's nothing we can overcome according to God's plan for your life, my life, our life. There's nothing we can overcome because he's already overcome it. Okay, so stop being afraid to step into what he's calling you to do. Stop being afraid to commit yourself to Jesus Christ. Stop being afraid to do what God desires for you to do. Stop being afraid of being the leader he desires for you to lead, to, to, to be, so you can lead who he desires for you to lead, so you can raise up another leader. Stop being afraid of that because he's already overcome it. He's already overcome it. So in verses uh, 1 through 3 here, Moses is, 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 is recognizing a couple of things. Um, and uh, we, we need to look at this, and I want you to please stick with me, okay, because some of this is kind of bitter at the start, maybe a little bit, right, maybe a little challenging, okay, but I want you to stick with me because we're going to get through it, okay? We must recognize our mortality. We must recognize our mortality. People don't want to, I don't want to talk about dying. 
Well, you're not going to live forever. Just guess what? You know, because it's a reality, okay? I don't like the idea of mortality. I don't care if you like the idea of mortality. There's two problems with that. Number one, it's not an idea. It's a fact. We're going to die. Number two, I checked the, more, the, the death rate, and it is still hovering right there at that 100%. You're born, you're going to die, right? And so let's get over ourselves. Let's stop being afraid of accepting the fact that we're mortal, that we're, we're going to die. Let's stop, stop with that. Let's start thinking about, let's look at it, let's look at it in a church view, okay? Because this is, this is where we're going to go with this, okay? So we need to start looking at it. Uh, so we come together, this church, okay? A bunch of people come together. We love each other. Okay, most of you love me. Some of you don't, that's fine, that's okay, right? And so I don't care. Um, God loves me, that's still good, right? So we come together, though, seriously. We come together, we love God, we love each other. It's all great. Oh, man, we're growing, we're doing this, we're doing that, you know? Um, and, and it's all going along well, but then there's a point that we start getting a little bit older, we start getting a little farther on our journey as a church body and as individuals, and we get that, we're like, mm, I just don't want things to change, there's these young people keep coming in here, right? They want to change things. And so we refuse to change. And so then what we do is we, we, we continue to love each other, most of us. Because sometimes someone might want us, they might, might be up for change. And then that person's a mean person because we don't want to change. But we still love each other. We're still, we start getting older. And the church body starts getting smaller. The same thing's true for your life. Wherever God's got you at, whatever he's got you leading, the same is true. It, it, mortality is mortality. If we don't embrace the fact there's going to be new life and things are going to change and things are going to go a different direction, especially even within us, right? As we learn, we grow. I could tell you, go back a decade. Sheldon was rejecting the idea that God would ever use him. After all, why would he? Okay? Sheldon had to accept a whole lot of change coming up to where we're at today. Sheldon never envisioned himself to be in a place like this, doing a thing like this. You know why? All the people were hypocrites. You know a big part of why they were hypocrites? They didn't want to change. They were afraid of change. They made it all about themselves. And when a church does that, it dies. When you do that in whatever it is God's calling you to do, what you're doing will die. And you can go, well, no, business is booming, dude. Check it out. Only for now. And trust me, Satan supports businesses too. Satan loves it when we reject God and we do it our way and we don't ever want to change. Moses, over three 40-year periods in his life, right? Change, change, change. How many changes we just look at, right? We've got to embrace the fact that there's going to be change because we're more and face our mortality because we are mortal beings. We are going to die unless the second coming comes when we're walking the earth and we're right with Jesus Christ. Right? That's the only way we're not going to die. Be like, yeah, here I come. Right? Walking along and all of a sudden, wait, where did where'd he go? <laughs> you know? And, 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 and you're going to be going, oh, Oh, maybe I should have changed, right? And so, anyway, let's let's we need to recognize our mortality, okay? Um, so, uh, we also the second thing we need to do is we must remember God's immortality. We got to remember God's immortality. God, get this, check this out. This might be a mind blower for some of you. Um, I, I, I certainly pray it's not. But guess what? When you die, when I die. God's still going to be here. When all of us die, God's still going to be here. He's still going to be hanging out. He's going to be around going, hey, check it out. I'm still in charge. Because of his immortality. Some of you might be, oh, but wait a minute, there's heaven. 
And I'm going to say, wait a minute, how are you really with Jesus Christ? Because there might not be heaven. I've had a couple of those conversations this week. Just asking people why they think they're going to heaven. Having a relationship with Jesus Christ was not an answer. But they go to church. But they do zero according to God's plan. They're not living it out. They're just claiming it. Slap out a name tag. And I'm not picking on them, right? And I pray, hey, if you're watching, <laughs> um, I'm not picking on you. But it's the truth because they're not the only ones. Because they're not doing what God's called them to do. They are rejecting God's plan. They're rejecting the Savior because it's an inconvenience. Because if I follow Jesus and I actually follow Jesus, like that whole Christian thing's supposed to be, if I really do that, it screws up my golf day. It really messes up my NFL season. But we camp and fish all summer long. Well, Jesus doesn't want us to not fish. He said, go be fishers of men. And he didn't say be fishers of walleye. Not saying that's wrong, but that should not be your God. If Jesus doesn't control your calendar, then you're not living in Christ. If he does not control your calendar, if he's not the one scheduling your calendar, if what you do has nothing to do with Jesus Christ, on that day, it might get a whole lot hotter for you. Right? And those are conversations I don't like having, except for the fact, just as I shared with the people I shared them with, if you were to walk away from here right now, get in your car thinking just because you showed up on Sunday, that made you a Christian, just because you said the prayer that pastor told you to say in, in Sunday school or at baptism or whatever, just because you said that word, I said them exactly the same way. I held my tongue just the same way. I even squinted my one eye just like he did. It means nothing if there is no internal transformation. It means nothing if Jesus Christ is not in control of your life. It means nothing. And I would regret, I would, I would, it would burden me heavily if we parted ways right now and I did not express the opportunity for you to understand the truth of being a Christ follower, that you might actually give your life to Jesus Christ, that he might actually, you, instead of inviting him into your filthy old heart, instead you go into his heart, be born again in Jesus. So we're in a clean heart, a, a holy heart, a righteous heart, and we have a righteous mindset about our heart, at least I offer that to you, and if you reject it, that's on you. But if I didn't even offer it to you and you left here and you were in a car accident, no longer, but I could have shared the gospel of Jesus Christ with you. I could have shared the invitation for salvation with you, and I didn't, that's on me. But if you want to reject Jesus, you go ahead. It's not the words I used with it, but that's the, the reality is... If you want to reject Jesus and say, no, you don't get to control my calendar, that's your choice. But when that car accident happens, that was your choice. Okay? We have to understand we're mortal. So when we say, well, but there's heaven. God's not the only immortal. Well, I mean, there's eternal hell, right? Etor eternal torment. Eternal fire. There's, there's that. There is eternity in heaven. But God's the immortal one. He's the one who's going to be here after each and every one of us is gone. And we have the opportunity to be with him. Depends on what we choose to do with the opportunities we have before us. But anyway, um, so God's not going anywhere. He's going to be here.
see Moses was here for that 120 years and, and but but he made an impact for 4500 years so far right and you're sitting here going but 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 pastor wait man now I feel like crap right you don't have to for one right let Jesus be in control of your life and your calendar and 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 give yourself over to him and die to yourself and be born in him do it right now I'm good with that you could say the prayer God's giving you the words right now for it I guarantee it Lord, I've been a filthy, nasty old sinner. I've been living my life for my, myself, right? But Father God, guess what? I don't want to do that no more. I want to be who you call me to be. From now on, from this moment on, I am yours. I will die to my calendar is no longer mine. My calendar is yours. Fill it up. Moses, 120 years on this earth, 4,500 years later, and counting, uh, he has never been forgotten, not even close to being forgotten, right? And I'm asking you to do the same thing, and you're saying, Pastor, I have there. What, what could I possibly do? What could I possibly start? I mean, like Moses already did all that stuff, right? What can I do that's going to last for 4,500 years? Let me encourage you to this. Let's do 45. Can you impact the next 45 years? Would you be willing to step into at least that? Because Moses didn't know he was going to impact 4,500 years either. And every person on earth, in one way or another, he didn't know that. So how about we just, we step forward and we do what God's calling us to do to impact and be unforgettable for the next 45 years. How about we do that? I think that's going to make a difference. I think God's going to be really pleased with you. And, and, and even though you might not ever see it in your lifetime, I think you can impact 4,500 years, according to what I read, right? And so, anyway, uh, so more, uh, uh, Moses is 120 years old. He's standing in front of the entirety of the Israel, Israel nation, the Hebrew nation, um, and he's got he's got uh, um, Joshua standing over here, and he kind of he's he's kind of he's kind of like uh, picture this with me because I like to have fun with this. So so Joshua's just kind of hanging out over there. They're playing cards or something, and and Moses is like, "Hey Joshua, come here, man, come here, come here, come here, something to share, right?" And he brings him on over, and then he addresses the Israelite nation. Okay, some people say I take things too lightly. <laughs> I say you can take them really heavy too, right? Um, but Here's what it says in verse 7. Deuteronomy 31, verse 7. But uh, Then Moses summoned Joshua and said to him in the presence of all Israel, Be strong and courageous, for you must go with this people into the land that the Lord swore to their ancestors to give them. And you must divide it among them as their inheritance. The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Did you catch what Moses just said to him? He said, Joshua, buddy, here's the thing, man. Love you. Proud of you. So grateful for you. I'm about to lay down the mantle. And you're the one to pick it up. I need you to pick up the mantle. For the Hebrew nation. I need you to be God's man for the Hebrew nation. That's what Moses is doing. He's saying, I'm going to lay it down. You need to pick it up. Don't worry. God's with you. He's never going to leave you, never going to forsake you. He's going before you, right? The land he's already promised as an inheritance to his children, he, you need to go lead them to it. That's what he's telling them. You know what? The God that carried, uh, uh, Moses is telling him that God got me to this point, right? He's brought me this 120 years. Your turn, step up, go make a difference for 45 years. Okay? The, the number I used a minute ago, okay? That's not scripture, okay? Um, but he's saying, pick up, your man, pick up the mantle, take it on for the next 45 years, take it on for the 120 years, take it on for whatever number of years God uses you. He's saying, just pick it up and take it. God's with you. God's with you. He's going to guide you. You just listen to him. You just let him fill your calendar. And that God that was with them was the same God that's with us today. And he's the same God that's going to be with our children, our grandchildren, our children's, uh, our, our, our children's children's children, and so on down the line. Okay? 
And, and, and so that's, God's, God's not limited. He's not limited by time. He's not limited by ability. He's not limited by anything except for us being willing to do what he asks us to do because he doesn't force anyone into anything, right? We remember that, right? He gave us freedom of choice. He gave us free will. So we can reject him. He's asking us not to. And Moses is telling Joshua, don't reject. Just get up here and do this. I need you to just step up, pick up the mantle. Let's go. See, Moses understood something. It's something we need to understand. We must realize our stage in life. We must understand our stage in life. I think my notes said life stage, though, but it's okay. Right? We need to understand that. See, we need to understand where we're at. Moses said, I'm at life's end. Joshua, it's time for you to step up. Okay, because Joshua, now mind you, it's not that Joshua wasn't stepping up at all before, right? There's a reason. God already had been training him up. Moses already trained him. He's already being trained up. Right? So, so he's, he's, he's preparing him. We need to understand that too in our life. What stage am I at in life? Now, you can go dye your hair. That's fine. Whatever. Throw on your war paint. Try to cover up the wrinkles. I don't care. Do your thing. Oh, but I'm prettier this way. I don't know. I think God's going to argue with you because he's going to be like, I made it perfect. Now, you just threw that stuff on, right? But we can go. We can dye our hair. Well, I don't want people to know I'm that old, right? They, I, I love it. These guys who do this, they have hair like mine, and then they go do Grecian, and now tomorrow they're jet black. <laughs> yeah, that's natural. Whew. That's way better than what God had going on. Hmm. Right? We need to accept our, our stage in life. It's okay. Stop going to the, to the hair farmer so he can put in some rows of hair for you. Stop going doing that, right? For crying out loud, let's, let's get over that. Let's accept where we're at. Stop going to the, to the, to the uh, uh, um, uh, oh, man, lost my word, uh, um, vanity. Stop going to the vanity doctor. Stop going and get the injections. Need my Botox. Oh, he'll do a little snip and a little sip. And And trying to change what God's already created perfectly for the plan that he has for it. Moses didn't go, you know, I just, I think I want to hang out here. I'm going to reject Joshua now because then God will let me live longer. Right? Thank God they didn't have makeup back then. Well, they did. Man, that was some stuff too. But the point's this. We have to accept where we're at in life. Remember that thing I talked about? We change, things change. We gotta have that change. God didn't want us to be 20 for all of our lives. He said, you're gonna be a beautiful mother and after two children, guess what? You're gonna be even more beautiful than you were before those two children. After 20 years of marriage, guess what? You're gonna be even more beautiful. You're gonna be, he's gonna be even farther in love with you than he was on day one. It's gonna just be, that's what God says. The day you die, guess what? He's gonna say, you're gonna be the most beautiful corpse in the world on that day. Not because of anything you've done, because of what he's done. And when we do what he asks us to do. So we need to stop faking it. Stop denying what stage of life we're at. Let's start living our life in the stage where we're at. And when we're willing to accept the life stage that we're at, then we'll be able to raise up our replacement. Because we need to raise up your replacement. Okay, we, we're called to raise up our replacement. Jesus said what? He said, go make disciples and then hang out? Just sit on the bench, right? No, he said, go make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. Make disciples of all nations. He said, come and do, come and follow. Everything he told, uh, told us, even if he didn't say literal, come and do, he said, come and do as I do. He's all throughout his entire ministry was about come, follow me, come do this. He always was setting the example, always and forever. Moses was doing the same exact thing. He was setting the example. And that's why Joshua knew exactly what to do when it was time to step up. And even if he didn't know all the answers, he knew all I have to do is step up. That's what he knew to do. 
And that's what I always ask you guys and I always encourage you about. Step up. Just do what God's calling you to do. I don't know what the next step is. It just because you don't, it's no reason for you not to take the step. If God's calling you to it, just take it. That path is a whole bunch of steps. Just take them one at a time. That's it. And that's how we raise up replacements. One step at a time. I don't know how to train them up. I don't know what to do. Great. Neither did I. <laughs> right? All right. But you know what I did? I took the step. I was like, I knew I need to talk to this person. And I knew, can I share? I knew when Jordan and Amy lived behind us, I knew that first day that I came over and talked to you, that day we just, we met like on the border of the yards. I knew, I knew I was supposed to talk to Jordan. I had zero idea why. But I knew God was telling me to talk to him. And we talked. And over the years, we've talked and we've talked and we've talked. And you've seen what's going on in Jordan's life, what, what God's been doing, right? I didn't do that. I didn't raise up a leader to take my place. But I did raise up. I did everything I can, poured into you in any way I can. And I continue to do that because I knew God said, take the step, go and do. But God is using Jordan as a leader in mighty, mighty ways. And he's not done. And 45 years is not going to be even close to it. It's 4,500 years coming up. I didn't know what to do. Don't let that stop you. Moses didn't know what to do. He ran away. He went to Midian. He went to hide out. Oh, I killed the dude. I thought I was going to raise up people and lead them away. I killed the dude. I killed the Egyptian soldier. Now I got to go and hide because Pharaoh wants to kill me. I don't know what to do. But he went where he was led. He did what he was. Why am I a shepherd? I thought I was going to lead the people out of Israel or out of Egypt, but oh, apparently I'm just going to tend sheep. Oh, wait. Now there's the next step and the next step and the next step. And do we remember last week when I shared about being smart? Moses, he knew everything, didn't he? No. He's sitting in the midst of one and a half million plus or minus 100,000, I don't know, whatever, right? One and, a, one and a half million people, he's sitting in the middle trying to do everything himself. He didn't know, but what did he do? He listened to his father-in-law, Jethro, who God already put in his place. If he hadn't gone to Midian, he doesn't know Jethro. Jethro was raising up that next leader as well. Just because you don't know what you're doing doesn't mean you're not supposed to do it. So let's be willing to raise up our replacement. Some of us, most of us, know there's someone we need to raise up. Even if we don't even fully understand what we're raising them up to because we don't even know what we're doing. Most of us know we got someone we need to raise up. Most of us in here are parents. We might have had to raise someone up, didn't we? And if we're being a parent that's a leader in our household, then we're raising up a future leader, right? For the next 45. Right? You're supposed to be raising someone up. If you don't know who it is, ask God. He'll, he'll open it up for you a little bit. Let me share something with you. Anyone here not know, not know Chuck Swindoll, or at least the name thereof, who he is? Okay, Chuck Swindoll, pastor. Pastor for many generations, actually a phenomenal pastor. Um, he was, uh, Chuck Swindoll was, uh, he tells the story of his first church, okay? Now, Chuck Swindoll was one of the original mega pastors, so to speak, okay? Um, so Chuck Swindoll talks about he was a pastor at his first church, and, and um, man, he, he was there, but it was like it was, just wasn't working out so good. He just didn't think it was going anywhere, and he didn't think it was really the right fit. So he talks to the leadership board. He's like, I don't know if this is the right, right fit here. I don't know if this is where I'm really supposed to be. And to, to his chagrin, they agreed with him. 
Okay, so they're like, you're right, see ya, you know, and so he's gone. He, he resigns his position, he's gone, um, and uh, so he goes to his second church. Now, the second church, things went really well, and it grew, got really big. And Chuck Swindoll, when he's at this second church, down the road a ways, right, because it became a very prosperous church, um, down the road, there's one of his leaders uh, from his church came to him and said, um, Mrs. So-and-so, is, is, is she's, she was a very elderly lady. She, her health isn't doing so good. She's in the hospital. She'd like you to come visit her. And he's like, okay, I'll go visit. And so he went and visited her. And uh, so when, she walks in, when he walks in, she takes his hand, she squeezes his hand a little bit, and he says, uh, Pastor, who's going to do my job when I'm gone? Now Chuck says, he says, uh, ma'am, ma'am, <laughs> not even name, ma'am, We'll find someone to do your job. Don't you worry about that. And she squeezes his hand a little tighter and says, No, preacher, I need to know the name of the person that's going to do my job when I'm gone. It says the preacher honestly uh, said, said, Honestly, ma'am, um, I'm not sure what your job is. He didn't know her name for crying out loud. He probably don't know what her job is, right? He says, I'm not, I'm not really sure what your job is, but we'll find someone that can do it. By the way, what is your job? She said, ever since you arrived here, I promised God that I would pray for you every day, and that I would fast and pray all night, every Saturday night, that God would give you power. Who's going to do my job? And it was at that point that Chuck Swindoll realized it was not him. It was not his, as he put it, it was not his, uh, uh, his, uh, him riding his abilities, but he was riding her prayers. The ministry had exploded, become what it was, not on account of what Chuck Swindoll was, but on account of the prayers that were being prayed over Chuck Swindoll, on account of the fasting, on account of the commitment, on account of the being real, on account of, of, of surrendering. And his response to her was, or his response to the interviewer that he was talking to was, I found somebody to do her job. I found somebody, he knew. It wasn't him. It was God through her prayers. He didn't know her. He had no idea what she did. Yet she wanted to raise up the person to take the mantle from her because she knew that's what God wanted done. That's what we're all called to do. We're to hand that mantle off. So, who's going to do what you do when you can't do it anymore? Or you? Or you? You? Who's going to do what you do when you can't do it anymore? Are you raising them up? But I just got started. Great. You don't have to teach them so much to start with. Right? Because you just got started. That's okay. But we're called to raise them up. We're called to raise them up. So Deuteronomy 34, verse 5. Uh, so Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, just as the Lord had said. The Lord buried him in a valley, in a valley near Beth Peor in Moab. But to this day, no one knows the exact place. I want you to write this down. Realize your significance. Realize your significance. Moses realized his significance. God realized Moses' significance. And, and God buried him in a place in a place where no one to this day knows where he's buried. Have you noticed that there's never been, you know, every now and then they come up, like, oh, scientists think they found Noah's Ark. You know, that's only happened like 15 times in my lifetime, right? I mean, it's like, man, I live in, you see, they constantly think they found this, that, the other. No one's ever come up and said, we think we found where Moses is laying. That's because 
Moses knew his significance and God knew Moses' significance. God buried Moses in a place that nobody knows because of this. No, Moses was such a significant figure. He was so significant to the Hebrew nation that if the Hebrews knew where he was buried, they would dig up his bones and worship him. Moses didn't want him to mo worship Moses. God didn't want him to worship Moses. Both of them wanted them to worship Moses' God. And you and I, when we die, better not want anyone worshiping our bones. We better want to worship our God. We have to recognize our, and realize our significance. We have to. So what are you going to do today that's going to last forever that anyone will even think of worshiping your bones? What are you going to do today to prevent anyone from ever wanting to worship your bones? What are we going to do? I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to, I'm going to preach until God don't let me preach no more. I'm going to love. I'm going to grow. I'm going to be the godly person that I know I'm called to be. I'm going to be Jesus to every person I possibly can be. I'm going to love on each and every one of you to the full extent that you'll let me. To the full extent that God will give me breath and give me a pulse to do so. I'm going to love my wife. I'm going to love my children. I'm going to love my grandchildren. I'm going to raise them up, set the example, live the life that I want them to grow up to live as well. I live the life I would desire my wife to emulate also. I live the life that I want my children to grow up and see and go, that's what I'm going to do. That's what I'm supposed to do. I will live my life the way that, that my grandchildren, when they see me, when they see Papa, they They want to live like Papa, not because of Papa, but because of the Jesus they see through Papa. And I want my great-grandkids to do the same because they see it in their grandma and their grandpa. Because they see it in their parents, which would be my, grand my grandchildren. And generation after generation after generation, that's what I'm going to do. I don't know what you're going to do. That's before you. That's what I'm going to do. I believe that's the greatest thing we can do. Don't live for yourself. Don't live for today. Don't live for this world. Denzel Washington. Anyone here know, not know Denzel Washington? Or at least his name, who he is, what he does. Okay, good. That one I got. Okay, so I really was surprised on Chuck Swindell. But um, so anyway, um, Denzel Washington, a very, very strong Christian man, very much so. Uh, but he admits there's times that he wasn't so much. He, he, was, he struggled, right? Um, especially he talks about in his teen years he struggled. Um, he, was, he was born a, a preacher's son. And like most teens, he rebelled. He, he says just a little, you know, um, right? Um, but uh, uh, as the son of a preacher, uh, he, 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 he regretted. He didn't, he didn't like spending so much time at church, right? Oh, man, there again, right? And, and his, uh, um, but he says, he says, I read the Bible every day, and, and I read my daily word. Um, and he, but he added this. He, he said it wasn't difficult for him because uh, growing up as a preacher's son to do that, but it was difficult for him growing up as a preacher's son um, in the world that we live in, right? And he said, um, but he said, he said it wasn't hard as far as him and his father. That was not difficult, okay? He, he said he, his dad, he said he wasn't a taskmaker, but there were certain things you couldn't do. And then Denzel added he, he had his own church, and it was a long Sunday because you had to be there all day. Everyone I grew up with didn't have a father. I had a father. My father was a decent man. He was a very spiritual man. He was a gentleman. So Denzel grew up in the church. He had faith. 
when he describes one day something that just rocked his world. He had a personal encounter with God. And he said this, he said this, he said, the minister was preaching. The minister was preaching this, and I'm, I'm kind of, I like this guy. <laughs> he's, he's, he says, he was preaching, just let it go. Just let it go. That's what he's preaching. Just let it go, right? Because we hold on to so much stuff, right? And he says, he was preaching, just let it go. And Daniel said to himself, I, I, I'm going to go with it. I'm just going to let it go, right? And then he had this, uh, this, this physical and spiritual experience. He said, it frightened me. He said, I was slobbering, crying, sweating. My cheeks uh, blew up. I was, I was purging. It was too intense. And this powerful experience, Denzel said, caused him to question his belief. He was struggling with where he was at with the Lord. So he called his mom. And, and, and he said, it almost drove me away. I called my mother, and she said uh, I was being filled with the Holy Spirit. And I was like, does that mean I can't drink wine anymore? <laughs> and so I thought that was kind of funny the way he said that. But um, So anyway, uh, so ever since, though, Denzel's been a proud, uh, he's been a proud Christian man. He's been con- considered a, 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 he's even considered, I should say, um, going into ministry. Uh, maybe, many of you might not realize that, but he actually is considered going, to, he still considers going into ministry. Um, and he says this, he says um, that uh, um, he's a, he has a habit he's picked up that he's, he's learned over the years. Uh, what he does, he takes his slippers and he puts them under his bed. And not just at the edge of the bed, but he puts them under the bed. And he said that way, every morning when I go to get my slippers, I have to get down on my knees to find my slippers. And he said, when you're there on your knees, why don't you just start by thanking God for the new day? Why don't you start praying and visit with God that day? And it helped him to remember to pray absolutely every day. And he doesn't care. If you take that home and you want to do that, go for it, right? I'm just telling you straight up, right? And so so he's, uh, so and there was something that he also, he does a lot of, 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 um, uh, graduations. Uh, he's, he's a speaker, keynote speaker at a lot of graduations. And one thing he shares, he, fa- he when he walks before he walks off the stage with all these college students just graduated, no matter where they're at, right? Whether it's a four year, six year, whatever de- year degree, right? He tells them this. He says, "Don't aspire to make a living. Aspire to make a difference." Don't aspire to make a living, aspire to make a difference. And I want to encourage you today, don't aspire to make a living, aspire to make a difference. Don't aspire to be okay. Don't aspire to show up on Sunday. Don't aspire to be, I'm all right, we're we're doing all right. Don't aspire to anything except for being exactly who God's called you to be. Don't aspire to be in anything except for who you're called to be. Don't aspire to anything less than that. Because we get to that place where we're just like, well, this is okay. I'm all right. We'll just, no, nah, this is this is fine. I, oh, but I served that one day, right? We have this tendency to, to aspire to, at best, mediocrity. Don't ever aspire to be mediocre. Don't ever always aspire to thrive in God. Always aspire to be the best you possibly can be in Christ. Always aspire to do everything God puts before you each and every day because he's putting it before you each and every day. Don't aspire to only be an okay to live, to make a living. Instead, aspire to thrive in Christ. Please join me before the Lord. Dear Lord, thank you. Father God, I just, I, I'm so grateful, so thankful that that you, man, you just continue to break my heart. You continue to challenge me. You continue to encourage me. You continue to lift me up. And Father God, I just thank you for also doing that for each and every person here. 
Father God, if it doesn't break their heart, then I ask you to break their heart for them, that they would be breaking their heart. Father God, I just, I thank you so very much for the message, for this series, for what you've asked us to do, the leader you're asking each of us to be. Father God, may we seek out our replacement. May we seek out the one to pick up the mantle. May we seek out the one to carry on in the plan that you have given us. In all that you have given us, Father God. Lord, I just, I just, ah, oh man, I just ask you just to, just to fill hearts, overflow hearts right now. Father God, I ask you to right now, as I, I'm just going to take a couple minutes here, Lord, and I just ask you just to speak to these hearts. Father God, I ask that as I'm silent, you're loud. God, as there's people who maybe haven't given their lives to you, I ask in this time, let them give their lives to you, Father God. Let them give their lives to you. Let me know how I can help, how I can walk with them, Father God. Father God, your son went to that cross for me. He went to the cross for each and every person in here. He went to the cross for us. And Lord, I just, we're about to go, come together in communion. On that night that he was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. He, he gave thanks. He thanked you for it. Passed it. He blessed the bread and passed it. And he told his disciples, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me, right? And Father God, he took that cup. He took that cup and, and Lord, he, he took that cup and he, he thanked you. He raised that glass, that cup, that wine, and he said, he blessed that wine. And he, he gave it to his disciples and he said, take Take a drink, just my blood poured out for you. And though they didn't necessarily understand it in that moment in time, Father God, they came to understand what it meant. And we know he went to that cross. He went to that cross and he bled and he died. He was ripped, he was torn, he was brutalized, Father God, for us. Father, he sent forth, he sent forth disciples. He sent forth, he was preparing, he understood his stage in life, Father God. He understood it well. And Lord, he, he sent out. And Father God, as we come today, as we come today, even if we don't understand, we don't understand what it is that you're calling us to lead. We don't understand what it is that you want us to step into. We just don't understand. But we know there's a step that we're to take, Father God. I ask you to help us to take that step just as Jesus did. And he said, yep, here it is. And I prepared them, Father. I prepared them so they could take over. And, and even though they didn't understand, Father God, they didn't understand. Help us even though we don't understand. Help us to be willing to step forward and take that. And as we take this bread, as we take this cup, Father God, I ask you to bless each and every person and reveal to them, reveal to them what it is that you have before them. Father God, I just ask that you would, you would just reveal it as we come together in communion. I ask each heart would be prepared, each, each heart, Lord, would be broken, and each heart would have that cup poured out over it, have that bread fed into it, that they would, we would have some meat and we would have the drink that we need, Father God, to step into what you're calling us to do. Father God, as we come and take this meal together, let us never forget the family that we are and the family we are to become. And so, Father God, 
I just ask that you have your hand on each and every person as they come forward for communion. And I thank you in advance for all you're going to do. In your loving Son, Jesus Christ's name I pray. We pray. Amen. So we're going to do communion. Um, give me a moment and I will uh, provide communion for Johnny and, and uh, Jared. And then uh, uh, because I, I, I kind of failed at this this week, um, I'm going to ask Jordan to come up and help me with communion because um, I forgot that I wouldn't have been here today and Johnny was going to be up here. So um, give me just one second. There I am. If you need a, I always prepare yourselves, right? I pray that you're preparing yourselves while we prayed, but prepare yourselves in this time to receive that, to receive the blessing that Jesus Christ shed for us, the blessing he gave to us in this sacrament. Just prepare yourselves that you're ready if you got something you're struggling with, you got something you haven't given up to God, give it up. Give it up and come with a pure heart. 